that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, we may have life in his name. Now, now you may be seated. Do not doubt, but believe. Jesus says these words to Thomas as he offers to have him place his fingers in the wounds as proof of his identity. Today's passage is traditionally billed as Doubting Thomas, and this Easter is the first time I have read it and felt that maybe Thomas got a bad rap. We all know how it goes. Jesus finds the disciples who are in hiding in the upper room behind a locked door. He appears among them and says, Peace be with you. Now this is Jesus' second appearance to his disciples. The first was to the women who had come to the tomb to provide for his body. That happened earlier in the morning. And when they arrived, the tomb was empty except for two angels, and that's in John's version. Then Jesus spoke to Mary Magdalene, who had recognized him after he said her name. He then sent her to the rest of the disciples with a message regarding his ascension. And she went to where they were and told them that she had seen the Lord, and she gave them Jesus' message. Still, now, when Jesus comes to them, they are locked behind a door in fear for their lives from the temple authorities. And with good reason, because as we can see, while the Jewish community within the Roman Empire does not possess any real power, they have been able to manipulate the Roman government so that they have crucified their teacher, friend, and Lord, Jesus Christ. It does not take much imagination for the disciples to think they might be next. Guilty by association, so to speak. So despite Mary's message to them that Jesus is indeed alive, not dead, like they saw, that he is risen, they are still very much afraid, and they are in hiding. And hours later, they are in that very room where they spent their last happy hours together. They have retreated to a place of safety and memory. And this is where Jesus finds them. So what does Jesus do? First, he bids peace to the disciples who are literally hiding for fear of their lives. Then he shows them his scars. It's the evidence of his scars which causes rejoicing amongst the disciples. They did not seem to recognize him prior to that. Even with Mary Magdalene's message, or with his sudden appearance amongst them in a locked room, or even his message of peace spoken in his voice, None of that brings recognition. It is the scars on his hands and the wound in his side that brings exclamation of rejoicing. Jesus again speaks words of peace, peace be with you, and then he gives them a mission. Almost immediately, there is no time to waste or wait. And there is also no time to wonder about the miracle that stands in front of them. There's no time for recriminations or apologies. Jesus wastes no time on judgment either. He wastes no time on where were you, or how could you, or why didn't you. Instead, he shows them his wounds, he grants them peace, and he gives them their assignment, which is this. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then Jesus breathes on them, breathing the Holy Spirit onto them. And then he continues their instruction, commissioning them. God sent Jesus into the world to bring the love of God into the world, a redemptive love that changes lives into the world. 
and the world reacted by trying to kill that love. The sin-filled world, so foolish to believe that it could ever truly kill a pure, true love, such as the love that a God who creates has for its creation. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto the disciples who are there in the room at that time. And he gives them the charge of forgiving sins, just as he does in his name. And he charged them, charges them with a mission, but he equips, he equips them for that job at hand. And he gives them with his peace, a peace that was freely given as a grace of mercy, despite their lack of understanding and despite their fear. And a peace given to undergird all that would come in the days ahead. He gifts them with the Holy Spirit to guide them in their discernment as they enter into the role of church. All of this is done without a conversation about their doubt, which was apparent. It was as obvious as the locked door and their confusion. Now, not all of the disciples were together, and Thomas, our hero, is one of who one of them who is not there when Jesus first comes to the upper room with a locked door. And he might not have been there when Mary Magdalene made her early morning announcement either. It really isn't clear. However, when the other disciples tell him that they have seen Jesus, he tells them he will not believe them until he sees with his own eyes the evidence of the nails and the spear in Jesus' side. It is these remarks, these statements of bravado, that have earned Thomas the title of Doubting Thomas. And for centuries, I think that people who are skeptical have been dubbed Doubting Thomases because of this scripture. But who exactly was Thomas doubting? And is it a fair label? I admit that I fell in with that crowd until I read it just this week, and now I'm not so sure. I'm also feeling a little indignant on behalf of Thomas. So let's look at it again. Is Thomas's skepticism really all that different from that of the other disciples? Now Mary Magdalene came to them earlier in that day, by John's account, and there was no response that we can see. They continued to be in hiding behind a locked door, the disciples. There was no rejoicing, no praise, no hallelujahs, no sudden understanding of Jesus' previous explanations of what was going to happen to him. Nothing. And they did not recognize him until he showed them his scars. Remember, this is the group of men and women who for three years regularly confused their mission and at the end argued over who was going to rule at Jesus' side in his kingdom. So let's forgive Thomas if he does not immediately, immediately believe them when they tell them that they have seen Jesus alive and talking in their kitchen. For I think that Thomas was maybe skeptical of the disciples more so than Jesus. I don't think he believed that they knew what they were talking about. Everyone had been under a tremendous strain, and I think maybe he thought that they had finally lost their grip on reality. Thomas is an outspoken disciple. If we look at his appearances in the book of John, we find him first in chapter 11, verse 16, when the disciples are trying to talk Jesus out of going to Jesus going to Judea to resurrect Lazarus because it was a dangerous place for Jesus to be. Thomas finally spoke up and said, all right, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas speaks up again in chapter 14 when Jesus is trying to explain to the disciples how it is that one gets to the Father. And Thomas speaks for many when he says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And now we have Thomas declaring that he will not believe that Jesus is back from the dead unless he can touch with his hands and see with his eyes the scars and wounds of Jesus' crucifixion. Thomas is the one who voices the questions of the people who do not dare, and in the meantime is ridiculed for lacking faith. But what happens when Jesus appears again? 
for he does come again a week later and Jesus comes again to the disciples in their upper room still behind a locked door despite their commissioning and the breathing of the Holy Spirit and their special instructions they're still living locked in their fear this time however Thomas is with them just like before Jesus appears among them and says peace be with you and then he says to Thomas put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it in my side do not doubt but believe and Thomas believes with instant recognition my Lord and my God what is interesting to me is that Thomas did no more than the other disciples to recognize the risen Jesus. Having Jesus appear without having to open the door for him did not work for any of them. A peace be with you in his voice did not work either. It was not until they all saw his scars and wounds that they recognized and believed. Just like Thomas, they needed to see Jesus' wounds to recognize him. They just did not have the audacity to make a sarcastic statement about it. But really, Thomas did not ask for anything more than Jesus had automatically offered to the disciples already. And while his words were bold and perhaps a bit defensive, maybe he was protecting his heart from disappointment. And who could blame him? He too had lived through that horrific week where he had seen his teacher, friend, and rabbi killed and now he was being told some ghost story. But when Jesus appeared and showed him his scars, Thomas immediately proclaimed him, my Lord and my God. Thomas's faith was restored or renewed. Thomas's faith, which likely had shrunken a bit, but I do not think it ever was totally lost. Because remember, this was the man who walked by Jesus's side into Judea even though he might die with him, so that Jesus could resurrect his beloved friend, Lazarus. Thomas was not a fair-weather disciple. His commitment to Jesus was deep and true, but he was also practical and maybe did not suffer fools gladly. His faith when he saw what Jesus offered, his scars to be touched, overflowed with joy. Jesus' question seems more rhetorical and directed more for those to come and less for Jesus, less for Thomas. For none of them believed until they saw the scars. And the question that I mean is, um, did you not, did you believe because you saw? Thomas was not any different than the other disciples. The only disciples who did believe without proof of scars were the women who only needed to hear their names spoken. After that, the disciples needed physical proof of Jesus' identity. Even though the disciples heard from the women that they had seen Jesus, they still needed their own lived experience with him. And while the disciples told Thomas about Jesus, he required his own personal encounter with Jesus as well. Is this not the case for most of us? Jesus' question is not an indictment. Thomas did believe more fully perhaps because he had lived had his lived experience with Jesus this personal moment that led to the revelation of Jesus as Lord and God we too tend to require encounters or events that deepen our faith or trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior I think there are those who are blessed in that they have not seen Jesus as <clears throat> and yet are able to believe and I think of my niece who believed in Jesus at such a young age. She loved him so completely with her little heart and soul. But we knew, but for someone like me, I've needed event after event of confirmation. And thank God that Jesus is willing to come through my locked doors to bring the peace I need, to send me on my way. With no time to waste and with no recriminations, just grace and mercy and love redemptive, restorative love. So do not doubt, but believe. Amen.